Let me now introduce uh, today's speaker. Um, David Schaefer is a professor uh, of educational psychology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he's at the Department of Educational Psychology, and he's and the, uh, is also with the Wisconsin Center of Education Research. Um, his well, we will ask him uh, quickly um, afterwards to <clears throat> also introduce his own um, perspective on his own career. It's finally, led him to into the learning sciences. So this is one feature of these webinars to have. Uh, a more personal kind of self-introduction, but <clears throat> some important, let's say, a more, from a more formal uh, um, introduction perspective, some important steps include um, a bachelor's degree in history and East Asian studies that also had some consequences in his uh, earlier uh, career steps, um, then a master's degree in media arts and sciences from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and also the PhD in media arts and sciences from this institute. He was uh, with uh, the Asian Development Bank and the U.S. Peace Corps in uh, Nepal, uh, and he supported uh, learning there. Maybe, uh, David, you will also introduce us a little bit about this phase of your uh, career. And um, in, with uh, the MIT, worked on also how kids um, uh, learn with technology, including um, games and also uh, uh, programming uh, languages. And uh, many of us became familiar with his work, his and his group's work on epistemic network analysis. Unity is uh, this uh, new technology uh, and this also this new, let's say, um, epistemic approach and uh, methodological approach to um, analyzing uh, discourse and uh, cognition data and text data. And um, I'll, I'll stop here and to, to give us a little bit more of a personal introduction uh, on your pathway, on your trajectory uh, from um, uh, media arts and sciences, and then uh, from the MIT uh, to uh, medicine and uh, into the epistemic games lab and epistemic um, network analysis. David, we are very much looking forward to your talk. The idea is uh, that uh, you give some introduction, you and your group are giving some introduction now, uh, more biographical, and then also into uh, the, the into epistemic network analysis and quantitative ethnography, um, and um, also several um, opportunities, of course, to interact with this group. Uh, and then uh, we will also have a short interview in the end where I will ask uh, a couple of questions in addition to what uh, the audience might ask. So, David, now the floor is yours. Sorry for taking a bit longer than expected. We are looking forward to the activities and your talk. Uh, no worries. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for uh, for hosting and for all the hard work that everyone, especially Daniel, but everyone there has done to make this this today possible and also the whole series possible. Um, you, you asked about the the personal story about how I got to where I am right now. Um, I guess those stories are always a little bit, uh, a little bit twisted, um, kind of a, a, a meandering path. Um, I, I finished my undergraduate degree and was interested in teaching. I had always been one of those kids who sat in the back of the class, and instead of being naughty, I sat there thinking about all the things that I could do better if I was at the front of the class. Um, and so I finally decided it was time to put, uh, as we say, my money where my mouth was and go try it myself. Um, and I guess the, the first thing that I discovered was that, uh, A, it's a lot harder than it looks from the back of the classroom, um, and that, B, uh, the, it seemed like students were not engaging. They were not thinking as deeply, they were not thinking as authentically as they could be about uh, things that I was trying to teach. So I was teaching uh, American history, um, and American history, for those of you who know what uh, that class is like in, in high schools in the United States, uh, is about a lot of names and dates. And similarly, when I taught math, it was about memorizing a bunch of equations and formulas. Um, there wasn't real, people weren't really, uh, the students weren't really thinking about things the way a historian did, which is how I was trained, or the way a mathematician does. Um, and and along the way, um, as Frank mentioned, uh, I had a chance to, uh, to spend two years uh, teaching and then also working with teachers in Nepal, um, which was very interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was that we were actually teaching in Nepali, uh, which was obviously a new language to me. Um, and so, uh, and I was also teaching in classrooms where there were 100 students, not enough chairs, not enough tables, 
uh, people barely had, students often barely had uh, pencils and papers to write on. Um, and so it was an experience of suddenly kind of stripping away many of the things that we were, that I had taken for granted as a teacher in the United States. Um, I really had to think about how my body moved in class and how it was that I could maintain order and figure out whether students were understanding when I really had very few tools at my disposal. Um, and when I came back from Nepal and went back to teaching in schools in the United States, uh, it was just about the time when uh, personal computers were starting to be widely enough available that they were making their way into classrooms. Um, and, and so it was this very interesting moment of going from a classroom with basically no technology at all the classroom where there was an entirely new technology. Um, and I saw this as a real opportunity, a kind of lever, if you will, uh, to rethink learning and with it rethink schooling. And that's what brought me to graduate school at the Media Lab at MIT. I was working with Seymour Papert, who was my advisor. Um, and of course, this was actually just about the same time that the learning sciences was born as a field. Uh, so in a, in a way, I kind of stumbled into being a learning scientist. My advisor wasn't a learning scientist. Um, but uh, there were people who were doing interesting work and uh, writing about it in the, in the Journal of Learning Sciences, and there was a conference that was relatively new. Um, and I went, and it, it was uh, just an, an incredible place to show up as a new graduate student. Um, I felt really kind of at home right at once, uh, all at once. Um, I, the early, in the early days, that conference was, was really small. It was a little bit clicky, to be honest. Um, and, those of you who went to graduate school in the early or in the early 1990s at Berkeley and Northwestern, I, I'm looking at you. But uh, it was a place where uh, every talk that I went to, even if it seemed like there were things that I disagreed with or wouldn't have been the way that I approached it, uh, there was a set of shared assumptions. Um, there was a shared interest in thinking about what education could look like and should look like in the in the digital age. And, um, the conference has gotten much bigger now, um, but those conferences still have a real sense of intimacy to them, and there's still a sense of uh, kind of shared values, if you will, among the people who are there. Um, I've done a number of other things with the Society for Learning Sciences since. Uh, uh, the Journal has done a great job of helping to build a field, um, but for me it's actually the conferences and events like this that have kind of kept me coming back and kept me connected, that, that have made that my uh, sort of uh, my home base, if you will, in the academic universe. I, I, I went to graduate school thinking I was a bit of a temporarily misassigned teacher, that I was going to kind of learn how to change schools from within, um, and realized that the problems and the questions were that I was interested in were much bigger, and frankly, that research was kind of cool. Um, and so uh, I continued on uh, in a, an academic career and uh, did a, some postdoc-like things at, at uh, Harvard and at uh, the Harvard a medical school, and then wound up here at Wisconsin and have been here ever since. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any other personal questions if the folks have, um, but uh, this was really, uh, my, my turn to research really came out of my experience in the classroom and my experience with technology and thinking about how those two things could come together in, in better ways than they had been in, in some ways than they still have. So Frank, is there a, you were, did you want to uh, ask more specifically about the way that what I do relates to the learning sciences, or uh, do you want to follow up more on the personal stuff before we go on? So I think if, if there are no uh, further questions from um, the audience, we, we should we just go on. Thanks for uh, this um, introduction, or at least here are experiencing some um, technical problems, there are interruptions from time to time, but it, I think it's, it's getting better. So I, uh, a suggestion could be if uh, some of us could pause their video transmuter. Okay, David. Okay, super. So, uh, Frank, you had asked me originally to say a couple of words about how what I do relates to the learning sciences more broadly, and I guess I'll just say very briefly that I see the learning sciences as a field that grew out of uh, computer science, psychology, and education, um, and that historically has examined computers and education, thinking about what's worth learning and how to learn it. Um, and uh, cognitive et uh, quantitative ethnography it connects pretty directly to that because it's a, a way of thinking about how learning happens. And I'll say more about that in a minute when I get to sort of the more uh, formal part of the presentation here. Um, but what we're seeing is a kind of explosion in data about what it is that students are doing. Um, and at the same time, what we see is, is that the things that we would like students to be able to do are very different than what we can measure with a traditional uh, test of basic facts and basic skills with the 
standardized bubble tests that, that are so ubiquitous. Um, we want to measure things like uh, teamwork, deep understanding of domains. We want to understand fundamental uh, changes in the way people solve problems, make decisions, they reason, they just justify their choices. We, we're interested in complex thinking. Um, and uh, that's, I think, part of the reason that ethnography has been a, a really fundamental tool in the learning sciences since its, in, its inception. Um, people have used qualitative methods to get at phenomena that we haven't de yet developed traditional psychometrics for. And so what quantitative ethnography is trying to do is use qualitative methods to investigate complex thinking, but then also be able to quantify those results to create models that let us measure learning from innovative pedagogy by measuring the kind of outcomes that we actually care about to get at the learning process and not just the outcome. Um, it's, a, it's an attempt to be mathematically rigorous about complex phenomena without losing the nuances uh, that we're so interested in. Um, so before I, I uh, sort of jump into the, um, the, the presentation part of, the talk, of, the, of today, um, uh, let me just say that, uh, that I'm going to ask you at some point along here to work in, in groups, and I think uh, one of the students here is going to be assigning people to groups, which will, in theory, happen automatically. Um, I think nothing really happens automatically in the webinar world, so hopefully we can all be um, patient with each other and with the technology as the day unfolds. If you happen to have a marker and a pen ready, that might be helpful. We, we'll do some drawing at some point. Not essential necessarily. And uh, 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 the video chat, as you, we can already see, is a little bit challenging with multiple people. So hopefully I'll try and orchestrate a little bit so that we, we things go smoothly. Um, please feel free to use the chat if you want to uh, uh, give me some back channel feedback while, the, uh, while I'm talking. And uh, I have a, uh, one of my colleagues is sitting next to me reading the chat, so he can wave his hand if, if something uh, urgent comes up. Um, anyway, uh, so let me, I'd like to, to just give you a kind of a couple of minutes here of background about the context for quantitative ethnography, and then we'll do a couple of activities and we'll kind of dig in deeper about a couple of, uh, a couple of ideas along the way. But the fundamental premise of quantitative ethnography is that learning is about enculturation. It, a way of thinking about that comes from the work of uh, Jim G, who writes about what he calls Big D Discourse. And what he means by that is um, a, some socially accepted association of ways that people talk and think and feel and believe. It's a way of thinking and being in the world, essentially. Um, and people who share the same culture, who participate in the same community, share the same big D discourse. They have particular ways of talking about things, solving problems, um, thinking about them, different ways of acting. In the learning scientists, the scientists people sometimes talk about this as a community of practice as well. Um, and the idea here, and now I'm drawing from some work by Charles Goodwin, um, is so if I see some dirt on the ground, what I'm thinking about as a learning scientist is, gee, if I walk in it, my shoes are likely to get dirty. But if I were an archeologist, when I looked at it, I would see the potential for there to be things like post holes or evidence of structures or information about the past. Now, the way that an anthropologist does this, or an archaeologist does this, um, is by looking at the actual color and quality of the dirt. Um, so, for example, uh, darker patches of dirt sometimes indicate a place where there was once a piece of wood making a post that had rotted away a long time ago. Now, they do this using something called a Munsell color chart. So it's a a uh, standardized tool for uh, looking at and, and uh, marking the colors of soil. Um, and the idea is that post holes and the Munsell color chart and soil, these things are all codes. And here I'm using the big C code following from the big D discourse. These are certain attributes, aspects of reality that people attend to and that they care about. And of course, the point is that these things are related to one another, right? We identify a post hole by using a Munsell color chart to analyze soil. Um, in other words, what we're trying to do from an ethnographic point of view is understand how codes are related and form a discourse because that tells us something about the underlying culture. Um, now, in the work that we do here in the lab, we build and test something called virtual internships. So these are uh, game, educational games where young people have a chance to role play as being parts of uh, uh, different professions. So for example, in one game called Rescue Shell, uh, students work as engineers, and they design a robotic exoskeleton. Um, <clears throat> along the way, they're working in teams, and they talk with one another, and they talk about things like performance metrics, 
the payload and agility that the robotic exoskeleton carry, the recharge interval, so how long the batteries last, essentially, how long they quickly take to charge. Um, and they think about design trade-offs, so the ways in which they're going to have a better recharge interval, but that may com compromise strength and agility, and so forth. Um, in other words, although what we want to understand is culture, what we're presented with in the world is what Jim G calls little d discourse, the actual things that people have, have talked about in the world. So when students are using uh, one of our simulations, they produce a log file that looks, oh, uh, right, they produce a log file. So that log file is essentially the ethnographical equivalent of field notes. It's a selection, it's a recorded selection of what happened that we're going to use to analyze. Um, so here's what our log file looks like, and so it's a series of turns of talk. Um, we also record mouse clicks and a bunch of other information that we could include. I'm going to focus on the talk today, although the, oh, the chat, the chat messages, the principles are pretty general across all those different forms of data. Um, this file is organized, as uh, most log files are, and most field notes too, into lines, different things, different events that happened over time. But of course, it's critical that those lines, those things that happen, don't happen in isolation. So for example, lines might be grouped together in a single activity, the same group of students working together on some particular part of a problem. And so in addition to lines, we have a multiple of and instructed discourse and how that structures a culture. And to do that, we need one more thing as ethnographers. So if the codes, the big C codes, are culturally relevant and meaningful aspects of a discourse, we also need something called little c codes, which are things that in the discourse that count as evidence or warrants for the code. In, uh, in our games, for example, for performance metrics, which are a discussion of one or more criteria for device functionality, a student might say something like, safety being is near the maximum, and that's a clue to us that they're talking about performance metrics. Similarly with design trade-offs, they might say, Switching to a, a composite to do aluminum, since there is room to sacrifice strength, is trading one feature off against another. Um, in other words, we get from little d discourse recorded in field notes to a set of small c codes, which are warrants about what's happening in the discourse. That lets us talk about the big ideas that are present in the community and the culture, see how they're structured, and make claims about the culture. Um, this is a basic ethnographic pathway or process, and uh, it was uh, called famously by Clifford Geertz, Thick Description. And the idea here is that what we're going to do is create a rich explanation of what's happening in the culture based on the actual evidence of what people are saying and doing and how they're making meaning of that. Um, a critical concern along the way, of course, is something called theoretical saturation, which is just a, a technical term for essentially asking the question is whether or not our description is thick enough. Do we have enough information to warrant the claims that we want to make? Um, now, one of the important principles of ethnography is that uh, it's always best to think about things locally. Um, so before we go on too much further to uh, pack, unpack and then repack uh, some of these ideas, um, what I'd like to do is focus in on kind of this critical connection, because the link between the small C code, the things that we would actually see in our data, and the big C code is a critical step in ethnography. It's what Andrew Pickering calls in the Mangle of Practice a mechanical grip. It's the way that, as ethnographers, we kind of grab on to the complex concepts that are happening in the discourse and make sense of them. Um, so what I'd like to ask you to do is, uh, in your groups, or, or are, they, are people in groups? Okay, I can't see that on my screen. Um, so uh, in a moment, uh, uh, one of the hosts, Brendan, is going to throw the switch and you will all, all of a sudden be redistributed into, the, into uh, smaller groups. And I'd, what I'd like you to do is spend just five minutes, um, and if each of you could spend just a minute or two thinking about what are some of the big C codes? What are some of the things that you care about in your data? And they just don't have to be a definitive list. And what are some of the ways that you identify those codes in your data? And then uh, just spend a minute or two um, maybe just sharing with your group kind of what are the what are some of the codes you care about and what are the ways the, the small C codes, the ways that you identify those in your data. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that and then I'll we'll call everybody back together and I'll I'll just ask for folks from a couple of the groups to just share back kind of what it was that they were thinking, partly because I want everybody to hear what everybody else is thinking, but also obviously part of the point here is just to get you thinking more specifically about some of the ways that this connects to, to your own work. Okay, so if Brendan, if you want to go ahead and throw the switch. Oh. The, 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 
Here we are again. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> We're back. Um, excellent. So, uh, so there are some very interesting features of this system. Um, one of which is uh, I have absolutely no idea what just went on your breakout groups. We were always completely cut off. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is, and I actually can't see who's in which breakout group at the moment. Uh, so let me just pick a couple names from folks who have a video chat in front of them and maybe just ask you to say uh, a couple of words about maybe what was similar between the uh, codes that uh, people were working with in your chat group and also if there was anything that was any interesting differences. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to pick somebody that I don't know so well. Um, Eben, would you be willing to uh, say a couple words about what the what people talked about in your group? What was similar? What was different about the code? Eben is texting on the chat because we're in a shared office. Ah, so okay. If we'll turn on our microphones, it's gonna get a little echoey for everybody. Got it. He's chatting on the chat. Okay. And he says, "Sure, I will have to type. We have a full office." Um, all right. You know what? Uh, actually, Paulette, would you? Is that your name? I'm, I can't read it. It's very yeah, small. Yeah, that's my name. Would you, would you be willing to share? I just think it'll be a little more efficient than typing. Not that I have anything against typing or against even. I was not on the same team of Sanders, That's okay. So. That's okay. okay. I'm just choosing randomly. Okay. So I was with Amanda, uh, and we both were talking about how we both um, measure identity, and that uh, identity as capital identity is really hard to measure because, like, it's silly to pretend we can measure a person's identity as a whole, right? We only, always care about a tiny piece. So mm -hmm. it's telling her I always have trouble knowing how to measure, um, well, how to code uh, small caps identity because uh, kids often have trouble identifying a scientist. So she was telling me that I statements is really good to do that. Like I am a scientist or I'm doing things scientists do or like engagement, specific instances of engagement are really good for that too. Sure. So that's what yep. we talk about. Great. And how about Sarah, per Sarah Perez, how about you? I, I, I remember I, I was able to hear you before when you were introducing yourself. Would you be willing to share a little bit? Sure. Uh, so I was actually in Eben's group, but we didn't really have time to go around the table. Uh, but I'll just share one example that I discussed with the group. So uh, okay. in my work, um, I look at what physics do in an online physics lab simulator. And one of the things we try to measure is whether students are trying to design their experimental procedure as opposed to just measuring uh, randomly and collecting data. And so some of the things that we look at for that is um, whether they're using a control variable strategy. So they're, at, you know, if they're measuring a solution in a beaker, then they're only changing the amount of solute a few times and then they'll change the volume of liquid, for instance. So we look at multiple lines of evidence that way to try to measure their um, expert knowledge of experimentation. Excellent. So it sounds like at least in, the, in those two groups, and I, my, I apologize, my camera does not appear to be cooperating. At least on my screen I see myself as being gray. I assume that's a bandwidth issue, but I'm not exactly sure what to do about it. So I'm just going to carry on as a disembodied voice. Um, it sounds like uh, the like in both of your groups, uh, one of the challenges is there are uh, big ideas or uh, big concepts from the from the domain that you're interested in measuring, but that you wind up measuring things that are kind of smaller features of that. And that's actually very often something that happens in uh, in coding. Um, so so that so that's, that's pretty common. Obviously, you're talking about different parts of of two different domains there. Um, another thing that, that often happens in common uh, in coding is, in the learning sciences anyway, is that as people deal with large volumes of data, uh, they're often interested in uh, finding ways to automate the coding that they're doing. So people use things like topic modeling or uh, uh, latent semantic analysis or other natural language processing. And um, again, often what happens is uh, those techniques focus in on smaller features in the data. Um, as a way of identifying uh, bigger ideas. Um, I'm going to, I'll keep going then, but, but what, whatever, regardless of the um, particular technique that we use to code, whether we're coding by hand or whether we're using topic modeling or something else, codes always have a particular feature, which is we have the initial data file, and I showed you this file a few moments ago, and somehow we have to append to each of the lines in the data file 
an assertion about some particular code. This is probably smaller than you can read the specifics, but these are the codes that we were talking about in the uh, uh, rescue shell game. And for each code, what we're looking at is whether or not that thing, there's evidence of that thing that we're interested in within any given line of data. Now, of course, as we were discussing, um, not everything can be understood just at the level of one turn or talk. So very often when we code, we actually code at the level of stanzas. That is, we aggregate lines together. We look at a whole conversation or a whole section of a conversation or a whole topic of a conversation. And we make assertions about whether or not some idea is present, something is being discussed, something is happening based on that stanza. At the end of the day, though, what we wind up with is for a code like design trade-offs, which like the ones that uh, Sarah and uh, Paula were talking about are big ideas that we see with small pieces of evidence, our code essentially winds up as a string of ones and zeros. There are times where people use uh, sort of percentages, the likelihood that a code is present. But in general, there's some assertion that for any given piece of the data, the code either is there or isn't there. That might be an assertion made by a person. It might be an assertion made by a machine. And of course, the challenge is if just one person or one mechanical process, so one automated process, makes that assertion, it's hard to know whether what's being asserted, that there are design trade-offs, for example, whether that's really there in the data. And so typically what people do is they compare multiple raters. Um, and what we're interested in, obviously, when we compare raters is whether or not a person in a machine or two people agree across a very long data set as to what the meaning of this particular code is. There are a number of different uh, summary statistics, that's what the S is, that people use. So things like uh, Cohen's Kappa and Krippendorf's Alpha, and there's a whole long list of them. And typically what you do is look to what we're hoping to say is that this me some measure of agreement is above some threshold. That's what the T sub S is. We have some measure of a level of agreement, and we want to see that as being above some cutoff value. The way we actually, so in our work, for example, we use uh, Cohen's uh, kappa, and we take a, a cutoff of 0.65, which is kind of a widely accepted cutoff value. Um, the trick, though, is that we don't actually want to have two people code all of the data. For one thing, in a MOOC or in uh, uh, educational simulation, that could be a, a tremendous amount of data. So what we do is we pick a test set, some subset of the data, and we have the two raters code that, and we compute their statistic, in our case, their kappa for that. So the question is, if we take this little subset of data and we compute a kappa of, let's just say, 0.78 for argument's sake, how do we know whether or not the true rate of agreement across the whole data set is above our threshold? And you can see, once we say that, that this is a sampling problem, right? So it's like trying to determine what the average height of students at UW is by measuring some subset of them. We ha there's some number of students that we would have to measure before we got a, 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 a accurate measurement of, or we could assert an accurate measurement from the sample about the population in general. Um, the problem is that for the most part in the learning sciences and pretty much universally, people don't do that. They simply measure the test set, they take the sample, and if the sample of the, cap of the, the statistic of the sample is above the threshold, they assume that the raters are in agreement. So we actually here in the lab ran a Monte Carlo simulation to test whether or not that really works. So essentially what, and essentially what we found is that it doesn't work at all. Um, so here are uh, the results of that Monte Carlo simulation. And what we're looking at is um, codes with different frequencies in the data and different test set lengths. And what you can see is that even for a code that appears 10% of the time, which is actually relatively frequent in discourse data, if you code a set 200 utterances long and you get a kappa above the threshold, it's likely that you're going to be wrong 10% of the time in assuming that it's true for a, a large data set. So we created a whole bunch of simulated data sets and tested this. Uh, in order to get a good, uh, a good generalization, you actually have to have codes that are like occur 20% of the time, which is really frequently. And you have to code like 800 lines of data, which is rather a lot for those of you who have coded, as those of you who have coded lines of data know. Um, so what we've done here in the lab to address this problem is uh, we've created a, a new test statistic. And what this test statistic does is it creates a whole bunch of simulated data sets with poor agreement that have the same basic features as the data that you've the, in the test set. So it has the same code frequency, for example. 
And then what we do is we sample from that big data set and we see the empirical distribution of kappa. And what we're looking for is how often the kappa that somebody saw in their test set, how many of these test sets with poor agreement have a kappa that's higher than the kappa that we saw in the observed data set. Um, and we call the statistic rho, and essentially what it's doing is providing an estimate of the type 1 error rate for generalizing from a test set. Or to put it another way, what rho tells you is when you've coded enough data to know that you have good agreement. Now, uh, that, uh, the mathematics of this are a little bit complicated. Uh, we've built a package in R, for those of you who use R or RStudio, um, that you can use to run rho on your data. Um, and we have more information about it online. Um, but because this whole process of coding and testing and checking is complicated, we've also built a tool that incorporates this and, and facilitates um, coding of data. Um, the tool is called the encoder. What it lets you do, just briefly, is upload data, define a code, uh, write the name of a code and define the code, and then create a, a, a word list, a list of possible cues in the data that might indicate that that code is present. And this can include both words and word patterns. They're called regular expressions, but they're essentially things like uh, something following something else, something before something else, and so on. Um, and then what the system lets you do is uh, code some of your data by hand, and then compare your codes to the codes that the automated system has. And it produces a kappa score, but also the row score, which essentially tells you uh, the likelihood that you'd be making a mistake in concluding that you're in a good agreement with, with the automated process. Uh, the system lets you do a few things, like actually send your data to another person to code, or you can tune the automated word list. So you can compare the differences between what you coded and what the machine coded. You can add or remove words. Um, you can change your own codes if you need to. Um, and along the way, you can actually see what's called the training kappa. So you can see how each of these changes affects your overall agreement as you're making, as you're making them. The point of all of this is that uh, what encoder and row are doing is giving us a quantitative warrant that the relationship between the little c code and the big c code is what we think it is. In other words, it's a warrant about theoretical saturation. It's a warrant that tells us we have enough information, we've coded enough data to reliably draw the conclusion that we're making uh, within our qualitative uh, data set. Now, there's an, another piece, though, that we're going to need, which is we need to think not only about the relationship between the small C code, the warrants that we're going to see in the data, and the big C code, um, that is, the in, things that we're interested in in the, in the discourse. Uh, we also have to think about the relationships between the codes. So often in ethnography, what we're doing is making claims about the way one code is related to another. Um, so, for example, when Sarah was talking about um, uh, uh, students using controlled experiments. Her interest is probably not just in controlled experiments, it's in what other things that students do are related to controlled experiments. What leads them to do it? What helps them do it? What makes it more difficult? Uh, similar, similarly, um, uh, Paulette was uh, uh, talking about identity, and she's probably interested in how identity is related to other things about the culture. Um, so what I'd like to ask you to do again, just for a couple of minutes, um, is Think about one or two of your codes, maybe, or three, I'm sorry, two or three of your codes, it won't work with one, and what the relationship is between them. Um, and what I'd like you to do is actually draw that in some kind of diagram. So if you have a marker, just take out a pen and, and actually sketch what are two or three codes and how do you think they're related to one another. Um, and this doesn't have to be something that you've proved in your data, something perhaps that you're interested in investigating in your data is just fine. Um, if that makes sense to everybody, I can't really tell because uh, I see only a bunch of still videos. Um, but uh, uh, I, I'll ask Brendan to go ahead and put you into groups. Again, I won't, you, I'll be on radio silence for two or three minutes, um, and then I'll, I'll uh, send you a chat, and then we'll call you back together. And what I'll hope is that a couple people will be willing to uh, share uh, their diagrams with us. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Hearing no objections, we'll go ahead and push the button. How, and, how, like, yeah. like, how, how, oh. and welcome back. <laughs> um, so, and what I was hoping actually um, that uh, people might do is uh, people might. I'm getting an echo from somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, 
I'm getting an echo from somewhere. I don't know where. Um, if folks would be willing, uh, those of you who uh, actually drew out a diagram of some kind, would you be willing to just hold it up to your camera so people can see everybody's diagrams? That would be really, I think that would be really helpful. I see one person. There are a bunch of videos that are frozen, so I think you'll have to unfreeze your video if you do that. Ah, you drew on the interactive whiteboard. Um, I don't know if there's a, so I'm not sure that, uh, excellent, as, as did Sarah. Super. Um, so Amanda, you can, you can put yours down now. Or, yeah, that's actually perfect. You just froze your video with it up there. Um, but Daniel, do you, is there some way we can share the interactive whiteboards in the uh, big group? Wait a second, I'll try to do that. that one. Oh, I see, I see LMU2 is bringing something up here. Super. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. So, uh, Freitas, would you mind just telling us a little bit about what's on your diagram there? Um, yeah, I only um, have two different codes on my diagram, so I started with mathematical argumentation and thought that it would be kind of increasing um, um, mathematical problem solving skills if you are better in mathematical argumentation. So okay. this is what I have on my diagram until now. Okay, excellent. Um, Amanda, can you uh, tell us a little bit about what's on your diagram? Amanda E. Um, actually, so I, I drew up what uh, Paulette had drawn in our whiteboard, uh, but we talked about science identities and the, the relationship between identity and interest and uh, how it may or may not relate to career interests or choice preferences and like are you going to go uh, to a museum versus going and playing video games. Okay. Is that correct? Oh, is that what you, uh, what you had meant? Yeah, and I was also talking about how I don't know how identity and being able to do science in a uh, accurate way according to the practices accepted by scientists is related. Yep. There seems to be like a missing link between both things, but I haven't been able to find it. Find it. Right. So there's at least three concepts or three or four concepts in there. There's a, there's um, identity, there's career focus, um, there's the sort of accuracy relative to science, there's accuracy relative to sciences of the practices and, and so on. There's, so there's a, a yeah. few codes in there. Um, um, sure. So Leanne, I see you have a question. Um, I'm just going to ask the LMU2 group to tell us about their diagram and then I'll come back to your question if that's okay. So LMU2, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's on your diagram. Um, so our diagram represents uh, <clears throat> three codes during problem solving and the relationship between these codes. And that would be the hypothesis that the problem solvers generate to explain the problem. And um, the evidence is, is the second code whether uh, while generating um, explanations to the problem they refer to um, uh, available information. And um, uh, the third code is how they solve the, uh, the solving the problem code. So whether the generated uh, explanations contribute to different solutions. Super. So um, uh, Leanne is asking, uh, I everybody can read it, I guess, so I don't have to read it back, but about the relationship between uh, little c and big C. So uh, the, dip, the, I, the relationship between the little d discourse and big d discourse, that big d discourse is some uh, uh, pattern. It's the, way in, it's the way in which people talk that mark them as being part of some community. Um, the little d discourse is the actual things that they say or do that may or may not be part of that pattern. So one, the little d discourse is the specific things that happen in the world, and the big D discourse is some assertion about the way that those things are related, what they mean, which things are acceptable and are not acceptable within a culture. But similarly, the difference between little c code and big C code is that the little c code are the specific things that somebody might say or do that we would take as evidence in the discourse. And the big C code is the, the, the meaning that those Thing, the, those little C code things have in the big D discourse. The big D discourse is how people make meaning. The, the big C codes are the things they make meaning out of. The little D discourse is the things they're actually doing out of which meaning are made. And the little C codes 
are the specific things that correspond to, in the, in the discourse, that correspond to the, the units of meaning within the big D discourse. Is that helpful, Leanne? Yep, great. Okay, um, so uh, I just want to reflect back for a minute. So uh, Amanda uh, uh, didn't unfreeze her video, which is great because the diagram that she and Paul had came up with is still up there. One of the things that I noticed across all of the diagrams that you guys presented is that the codes are related to one another using arrows. Now, partly I seeded that by showing you a picture of codes that are related to one another with arrows. Um, but the idea is that the, what we, when we think about meaning within a discourse, we're thinking about the way that things relate to one another. And those arrows are just a useful way of capturing that notion of relationship. So for example, in the data that we work with in the virtual internships, um, uh, and this slide is a little messed up from the upload to the webinar. We decided that one or two slides messed up was, was not worth reloading everything and risking uh, ruining the rest. Um, so uh, the students are designing this uh, robotic exoskeleton, and that has certain performance requirements. There are certain things that the robotic exoskeleton has to do. And in order to get it to do those things, there are design trade-offs. So there's some relationship between what the requirements are and how you're, they're going to make trade-offs in the design to fulfill those requirements. Um, but it turns out that as they're working, they don't actually go directly from performance requirements to design trade-offs. What they do is conduct a series of experiments where they're actually measuring the performance of devices and they're using that to make decisions about how to change the device in order to fulfill the performance requirements. Um, so once again, we can see that there's a set of relationships among the things in the data that we're interested in. So this is very parallel to the examples that uh, Paulette and Amanda showed, um, that Freitas showed, uh, and that um, the folks from LMU showed. Um, in, order to, in order to be able to talk about this set of relationships, though, one of the things we have to be able to do is talk about the way any two things are related to one another. For example, performance metrics and design trade-offs, which we've been talking about. Um, now, sometimes it happens that within a single action or a single turn of talk, we can see that relationship. Right? So here we see a student say, talking about the recharge interval and payload and agility and the way in which they're trading off one thing against another. Um, but of course, individual actions or turns of talk don't happen in isolation. Um, sometimes what's gonna, what happens is, uh, in order to understand the relationships that somebody, or the, the connections that somebody's making, we have to look at multiple turns of talk. Um, and so we might use, uh, and, and for that, we want to use the idea of a stanza. Remember, a stanza is a collection of lines that are related to one another. Um, so what we often do, and here I'm following some work by Gregory Dyke and also Dan Southers and colleagues, and uh, Carolyn Rosé and some others, on creating um, moving windows in the data. And the idea here is that for each turn in the data, so an action or a turn of talk, we look at the codes that are present in that turn of talk, and also the codes that are present in what uh, Dan Southers and others call the recent temporal context, the sort of uh, the talk or action leading up to this turn. And we look at the things that were said or done there, and we assert that there's a connection between them, that somebody's making a link, in this case, to uh, the uh, justification about design and the uh, consultants, which are the internal consultants of the company that are talking about it. The idea, though, is that for each turn of talk, we want to look at its own recent temporal context. And so this whole unit of the individual line and its context becomes the stanza. And then we kind of slide the stanza down along the data. So for the next turn of talk, we look at the connections that it makes within its little window of recent temporal context. What this means is that we can think of our data as not just uh, lines with codes on them, but each line of of in the data is actually a network that sh shows the connections that the person is making at that point in time, either in what they're saying or what they're doing. And what this means is that we can, so for example, the, the first line of talk there highlighted in red, the network might look like this. In the next line of talk, the network might look like this, which means that we can think about as the conversation evolves over time, as different people are talking, as somebody is taking different steps in solving a problem, these networks are essentially accumulating. And so over time, we might see that some connections become strong because they happen more and more frequently. Some new connections might get added in the data. What this lets us do is now compare this 
association network, this network of connections that, for example, one person or one group makes, we can compare it to the connections that another group makes. We can see whether or not they're making the same connections among the elements of discourse that we care about. Um, we can also think about this um, in mathematical terms, uh, so, we can, so we can compare this. We can also think about this in mathematical terms by looking at the center of mass or the centroid of the network. Um, so for example, for the blue network, the weight of those lines is over on the right-hand side of the network diagram. For the red network, it's over on the left-hand side. And what that means is that we can compare networks not just by looking at the two network diagrams, we can actually compare their centers of mass, their centroids, and see whether or not there are systematic differences between networks. And that's useful because now we can actually create a metric space. We can measure the differences in networks. We can compare their center of masses without having to look at all of the different uh, network diagrams for any, any comparison that we want to make. But we can interpret this space in terms of the layout of the different elements of the, of the discourse, the different codes. Importantly, though, what's driving this is not the individual codes, it's the connections between them. So the node on the, uh, the red node on the left is on the left because there are a lot of connections between collaboration and data and collaboration and performance requirements. The node on the right, there are more collect connections between performance requirements and performance metrics and, and so forth. Um, so here's what this actually looks like. Uh, sorry, so, so that's, a, that's a bunch of mathematics that you would have to do in order to make that happen. Um, so once again, we built a tool to facilitate that. In this case, the tool is called epistemic network analysis. Um, and uh, again, you can upload your data. You can choose what the units of analysis are going to be. You can decide what the uh, groupings of, of the, in the data are, so conversations among different groups of people or different activities. Um, you can create automatically create these moving stanza windows. You can decide which codes from your data you want to model. And when, you, and when the model runs, it produces something that looks like this. So this is actually the uh, average uh, discourse network from a group of uh, relatively advanced engineering students who are working in the rescue shell simulation. The little dots that, that you can see are each of the individual's centers of mass of their network. And that big dot in the center is the center of mass of this average network overall. Now we can compare this, as I was just saying, to another network. So for example, um, you can compare this to a network of a group of relatively novice students, so students who are less experienced in engineering design. And what we can see is that there, there's a pretty clear difference between the networks. And the difference is that the experts are doing are spending more time making these connections between performance requirements, performance metrics, and design trade-offs. Um, so uh, Daniel just asked how many participants, uh, uh, sorry, how much data in terms of instances or stanzas do you need to use ENCODER and ENA? Um, uh, so for uh, ENCODER, um, the, uh, the number is, uh, doesn't matter, but if you have a very small number, you probably don't want to use ENCODER. You should probably just code all the data by hand and have two people code it and compute your actual kappa. Um, for ENA, uh, essentially what you want to have is enough participants or enough networks so that you have you know, at, at least twice as many and hopefully more um, participants than you have uh, nodes, um, uh, because otherwise you're going to get a, a, a flooded model. So you want to have a fair number of participants relative to the number of nodes in your network, the number of codes that you're using, that is. Um, and in terms of lines of talk, again, uh, ENA is agnostic to that. The more lines of talk, the smoother a model you'll get. You, Things tend to be a little jagged if you have not that many lines of data, which is that's sort of a generically true in data analysis. Um, so Daniel, I hope that's helpful in, uh, in terms of answering that specific question. Um, just coming back to this network for a moment, uh, uh, as we were saying, we can compare these networks by looking at the networks, but we can also look at the centers of mass and compare those. So the blue dots represent the centers of mass of the more advanced students. The red dots, the centers of mass of the less advanced students. And again, we can interpret these, the position of these dots in terms of the network of connections from, the, from those network graphs. Um, but now we can also do a t-test, or we can download the data and do more, uh, more sophisticated statistical tests. 
um, we can look at the goodness of fit of the model and see the extent to which the network diagram is actually capturing the differences that we're seeing between, uh, between the participants. Um, and there are also, of course, lots of other statistics that one might use other than ENA to compare the interactions between codes. So people, you could use structural equation modeling. You could use a principal components analysis. There are lots of other techniques that you could use. Epistemic network analysis has the uh, advantage of producing a representation that actually is aligned with the claims that people are making. And it does a good job of modeling not just the codes and their frequencies, but the relationships between the codes, which is, of course, what we're interested in from an ethnographic point of view. Um, whatever statistical tool we might use, though, what we're seeing is that, once again, um, we get another example of theoretical saturation. Um, that is, we assert that there are certain, or we hypothesize that there are, there are certain relationships among the codes. Ideally, that's a grounded hypothesis, meaning it comes from our analysis of the data itself. Um, and we're modeling the network structure. We're testing whether there are significant differences in, the ne in those network structures or significant patterns in those network structures. And then using that to say that we have seen enough data to be able to warrant that the pattern that we're seeing in a few instances is generally true in the data overall. Um, and before we uh, uh, kind of close on this little discussion about ENA, I want to make another one more point, um, which is, uh, and Andy, I see your question. I will get, I, I will talk about that in just a moment. Um, the, uh, we're looking at an, a kind of highly abstract model where we're able to compare networks across multiple individuals. But for any one of those networks, we can actually see what the network structure looked like that positioned the person where they are in the network space relative to the other people that we're measuring. We can go one step further. We can actually click on the, the lines in the network model, and we can see the data that led to that particular uh, connection in the network. So we can see the individual stanzas you see one of them banded there in blue. We can see the terms of talk. We can see who said them in this case because it's a group discussion. And we can see what they were coded for. In other words, we're not just looking at an abstract mathem mathematical model that's been um, uh, removed from the original data. We can actually go back and reconstruct the thick description that the statistics are warranting. Um, put another way, right? What's happening is there are, in quantitative ethnography, there are multiple lines or multiple uh, warrants for theoretical saturation. There's the warrant of the original thick description. There's the warrant about the codes that we get from rho. And there's the warrant about the structure, the relationships among the codes that we get from ENA or from other, some other sort of statistical tool. Um, and this is useful because, as Clifford Geertz one of the, you probably know, one of the most famous ethnographers um, from the uh, last century wrote, um, the goal of ethnography is not to codify abstract regularities. It's not to make claims about how the world works in general. It's to make thick description possible. It's not trying to generalize across different cases to what happens for some class of people in the world at large. It's trying to generalize within them, trying to use the tools of uh, in, in our case, trying to use the tools of statistics um, to tell us something about whether or not the data, the things that we've observed about these participants is a general pattern in the way that they're interacting in the world. Um, in other words, quantitative ethnography is the science of using statistical methods to warrant claims about theoretical saturation in qualitative data. Um, I, I see there are a couple of questions. I'm going to turn to those in a second. Before I do, though, um, I just want to make sure that I thank um, the many, many people who have helped make this possible, including the U.S. National Science Foundation, uh, graduate students, research scientists, and other colleagues that I've worked with. And there's actually one name missing from this list that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. It's Arun uh, Srinivasan, who uh, worked with us as an undergraduate and did a, uh, some wonderful work on the uh, ENA and also on the, um, uh, the uh, row analyses. Um, and just uh, sort of by way of wrapping up before we get to some of these questions, um, 
what I've tried to do today is describe, kind of give an overview of what quantitative ethnography is about and describe a couple of the tools that we can use in order to make this connection between statistics and qualitative data. Um, all right, so I'm going to sort of stop with the formal talk part of the talk. Um, and uh, let, me, let me turn to a couple of these questions. And please feel free to ask others along the way. Um, I, there are, uh, as you can imagine, um, lots of different aspects of this that I didn't have time to talk about in uh, kind of a short overview uh, presentation. Um, so I'm happy to elaborate on things that, that folks want to drill down further on. Um, Andy asked how, did, how we got the positions of the nodes in the example. Um, and you're correct that uh, positioning the nodes is not trivial. And obviously, it's also critical to the claims that we're making. Um, the way that ENA does that, and I, I sort of skipped, skipped some of the uh, heavy math part of this, but essentially what we're doing is uh, converting each of those uh, 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 networks. So each network is, is represented by an adjacency matrix that shows the um, uh, essentially the uh, Associate, association structure. So think of it like a variance-covariance matrix that's similar to that. Um, what we're doing is projecting those into a high-dimensional space. And then, yes, you're right, we do a dimensional reduction. What we're essentially doing is uh, either a singular value decomposition or in the model that I showed you there, we're actually just making, forcing the first dimension to go through the means of the, of the networks in the high-dimensional space. Um, and then the nodes are positioned using optimization algorithm that is essentially trying to optimize the relations, the, the, or minimize the, the difference between where the points are in the projected space and where the centroids are. Um, I could, I'm happy to say more about that offline if you're interested in the, the details. But that's what that goodness of fit measure is showing. And essentially, uh, that model that I showed you, for example, had goodness of fit uh, using e either Pearson or Spearman correlations of like 0.98. So the, the model, we actually get extremely good fit on models that are good. Um, let's see. Uh, Freitas says, uh, it seems to me that the stanzas only allow to analyze the relations of the codes that appear next to each other. Is there any possibility? Yes. So, um, so that's a great question, Freitas. Um, there's actually a paper that Amanda Evenstone uh, is going to be presenting at ICLS that addresses exactly this question. Um, so one way to think about what, you, what you're asking is, should the stanza always be the recent temporal context, or do sometimes you want to have the stanza be more than just the previous few lines? And essentially, you can, you're free to set the stanza any way that you want. Um, so we actually do run models all the time where the stanza is an entire conversation, which would, which would address the question that you're asking. Sometimes it actually makes sense to have the stanza only be one individual line in the data, um, or one line in its adjacent line, or one line in the line that follows it. And all of those are, are uh, mathematically possible. Um, the ENA tool itself lets you do some of them easily. Some of them require a little more jumping through hoops. Um, and of course, you can actually construct the network models outside of the ENA tool and then upload it and do the rest of the analysis as well. Um, I see Sarah has a question. Oh, no, sorry. Ross has a question. Um, I apologize. It takes, it'll take me a second to read through it here. Uh, many fields like confidential things domain. Um, whoops. Uh, now it's jumping around. Um, Ah, okay. Um, so I'm I want to make sure that I'm understanding the question. But essentially, you're saying there's a set of a priori codes in the domain um, that we want, we think students should be talking about, or people should be caring about, and they don't necessarily all show up, um, obviously in the discourse that students make is, am I interpreting that correctly, Ross? Uh, standards, yeah. Um, right, so, uh, you know, the, 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 in any ethnographic endeavor, some of the codes are going to be emic and some of the codes are going to be edic, um, meaning that some of the codes are going to arise in a grounded way from what people say, and some of them are categories of experience that we impose as a researcher, or in this case as an educator, from the outside. Um, you still have the same basic challenge, though. Any, any assertion that you want to make about something that's present in the, in the data has to, has to come from some sort of small c code. Um, so, and you see this in the standards, right? In the standards document, people provide definitions of what will constitute evidence for the standards. They sometimes provide examples. So the standards documents are essentially trying to describe uh, the coding book for the standards. Um, so 
there's, if I'm understanding your correction, your question correctly, there's kind of no escape from, at some point, being able to say that the thing that I'm interested in, in this case, the, the big S standards, if you will, um, have to somehow be uh, uh, appear in some specific aspect of the data itself. Ross, is that, did, uh, did I understand the question correctly and answer it in a way that makes sense? While Ross is answering that question, I'll go ahead and read Paulette's. Uh, so Paulette's question is, do the interviews in a, could we do the interviews in a school um, in, uh, individually uh, and then put them together? So the, all that ENA is interested in is modeling the connections that you as the researcher think are, are, are at play in your data. So um, people use this on interviews all the time. So within a given interview, we could look at the answers to specific questions and take those as a stanza. Um, you could look at, you know, what are essentially topics that somebody talks about within answers to a question and think about that. Um, so interview data, people have, there are a number of papers on our website where people have looked at interview data. Um, you know, whether it would make sense to take an interview from one person and an interview from another person and put them together as one network, um, what I would say probably is, um, I'd have to think about it a little more, but I, I think that might not make so much sense um, because uh, because th those people are not actually interacting with each other. And so if you could compare them, you could construct an average of them, you could construct their average network. I probably wouldn't just add them together. That having been said, adding two networks together and averaging two networks is actually mathematically equivalent. So I suppose you can put them together in that sense. Um, I, I, Ross uh, uh, just chatted that uh, I had reasonably answered his question in the context of a webinar. Um, let me just add, Ross, that uh, we are very happy to uh, connect with people around their specific data and their specific questions. Um, we are very fortunate to have generous funding from the National Science Foundation um, that uh, provides us with the time and resources to actually work with people on their data. Um, help them think through the modeling questions, help them think through this, uh, their segmentation questions, which is how you break things into lines and stanzas. Um, so if you uh, reach out at the, to the email address below, uh, we'd be happy to set up a time. Uh, we can demo the tools, um, and we can certainly also just talk through some of the, some of the data issues. Um, so uh, Dan, uh, they are commercially available only in the sense, Dan asks if these are commercially available. Well, yes, in the sense if you count free as commercially available. Um, so these are on the web uh, right now, even as we speak. Um, they are, uh, they are researchware, um, which means that uh, we, offer no, we offer no guarantees um, at any given moment that it will perform perfectly, um, but we are also more than happy to engage with you if you have any problems, um, help you work through them, report any bugs, do what we can to fix them, and so forth. So it looks like a bunch of people are typing. I'm just going to wait and see what, how, how the system uh, uh, parses that out and, and tells me uh, what the next question is here. Um, you know, while we're, while we're waiting, um, I should say that uh, we've talked about this, I've talked about this here, um, mostly in the context of uh, chat data. Uh, we have also looked at uh, mouse click data, eye gaze data, EA has been used to look at brain scans, so pretty much anything where there's some network association structure, uh, ENA can, uh, can work. And the encoder also will work on any form of text data. So for example, field notes, handwritten field notes, if they're typed up, or typed field notes, uh, will work just as well as chat data, as will uh, you know, sort of interactional analysis data, which has diacritical marks and gestures and stuff. As long as it's coded in text, uh, encoder should be able to work with it. OK, um, so. Uh, why don't we call a wrap to the uh, sort of formal part? And uh, Frank, I know, does an interview at the end of these, and so I'm, I'm happy to be interviewed. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to first thank you very much, David. That was a fantastic um, introduction into a new methodology, and also uh, you gave us direct links to the tools, and even uh, you offered support uh, in, in using the tools. Well, one, one of the questions that we um, ask all our webinar um, presenters is um, uh, what, what would you recommend um, uh, to PhD students or 
uh, also master's uh, students for their studies and for their thesis. In, in this case, I can, I can imagine that uh, uh, PhD students are coming from work groups, are associated to work groups um, uh, in, in two quite different areas. So one uh, would be um, um, PhD students in work groups uh, who work on case analysis, so uh, let's say a discourse of, of two or three uh, people that is um, that should be analyzed in depth um, um, with qualitative methods and using maybe grounded theory and so on. And then other, others um, might come from more quantitative uh, approaches who in their work groups uh, would normally approach this by segmenting and coding the data and then afterwards uh, they would not be very sure how to reconnect all these uh, segments. And I think your, your approach could give, um, well, let's say a lot <laughs> to, to both of them. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? What would you recommend these uh, two groups of students? How, can, how should they approach uh, ENA and ENCODER? Uh, when is it um, of optimal use for them? That's a great question. Um, so I, my the single uh, um, best piece of advice I can give you would be to get in touch with that handsome gentleman up in the upper left-hand corner, Brendan Egan. Um, so he's a graduate student in my lab who is the point of contact for people who are interested in using ENA and, and or ENCODER. Um, and he can point you at uh, 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 papers, um, show you, uh, you know, give you a demo if you're interested in having a demo, talk through your data with you as I described. Uh, we have a mailing list, so you would get updates of uh, recent papers that uh, people are either the rewritten or the people are willing to share using the methodology. Um, and we're also happy to have people come and visit us in Madison. Um, you know, we're happy to help you learn to use the tool to talk about it in your context. Um, I do strongly recommend coming in the summer if you're going to come. The weather is much nicer um, and the beer tastes really good sitting on the terrace overlooking the lake uh, for those of you who have been to CSCL when it was here. Um, you know, honestly, I think that uh, there's really not a bad time to get started um, thinking about methods that you're going to use as a PhD student. Um, <clears throat> the, in general, earlier is better. Uh, once you actually started working on your proposal, sometimes finding new methods can be a little destabilizing. Uh, so I think it's good to, uh, to reach out early and start to think about um, what kind of data you want to collect and uh, what sorts of modeling issues you're interested in um, as a, in a kind of hand-in-hand -hand with the methods that are available. Is that helpful, Frank? Yes, thank you. So um, I think you know, my other question uh, has already been answered um, because you nicely related your work um, on, on quantitative ethnography to what the learning sciences is in your understanding. Um, so I think uh, that would also be um, a good point to have a final round of um, questions or feedback or uh, the otherwise also to close um, the webinar in time. Um, so is any question uh, remaining currently? So do you have any questions to David and his team? Um, one, maybe one point that <laughs> Before I missed that, I think one of the very, very strong points that you made today um, is that we have a somehow um, outdated or, well, let's say, um, uh, non suboptimal, let's say, suboptimal usage of our iterator agreement values. And uh, you offered a new approach to compare your uh, empirical kappa value to a distribution. Uh, could you maybe uh, again point us to where we can do that? I think this is something, uh, a take a home message that is quite straightforward. Uh, everyone should do that. I think uh, at least try to uh, test your own kappa value against um, this distribution. Yeah, so um, I, I'm happy to, to, say, uh, to address that and also um, seeing that there don't seem to be that many uh, other questions that people are typing, maybe I'll just make a little concluding remark and then we can wrap up, if that makes sense, Frank. I'll, I'll, take, your, I'll take your silence. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it does. Uh, okay. uh, so um, the, in terms of the, the uh, row uh, statistic, um, we, there's, uh, there's an R package that 
uh, you can download that has documentation that will essentially do the computation um, for you. Uh, if you want to do it kind of on your, just on your own data, completely separate from Encoder, it's built into Encoder. And that R package is available uh, for download on our website right now. And I think um, by next week, it should be available on the CRAN uh, site as well. Um, uh, if you're having any trouble finding it, just uh, email the address there, and Brendan will be happy to point you uh, point you to it. And it should be relatively straightforward as, uh, as our code. Um, <coughs> the uh, uh, there are a couple of good um, papers. Um, one in particular that's in submission to EDM right now. It actually got rejected from ICLS as being not relevant to learning sciences, interestingly. Um, but that's another matter. Uh, that uh, Brendan would be happy to share with you as well that documents the Monte Carlo uh, simulations, for example. Um, I should also say uh, that um, I'm uh, finishing up a book right now called, happily enough, Quantitative Ethnography um, that uh, should be available uh, sometime very soon. Um, and it talks, obviously, in more detail about uh, Rho and about ENA and about these questions of theoretical saturation about structuring your data for analyses, kind of all the topics that we've touched on a little bit um, so far here. Um, in the meantime, if, the, if people are interested in following up more on some of these topics, the, the uh, papers that I would recommend most highly from our website um, are a paper called What Good Are Statistics That Don't Generalize by Ron Serlin and by, by Ron Serlin and me. Um, Again, if you uh, send us an uh, email, if you can't find it, we'll be happy to point you to the paper. Uh, that and a paper called The Bicycle Helmets of Amsterdam, um, which talks about uh, the idea of uh, big D discourse and the way in which codes are related to one another within it. Um, and I guess finally what I would say is, uh, you know, if there's something in particular that I would recommend out of all this, um, it would be to think seriously about questions of uh, data hygiene um, and think seriously about questions of theoretical saturation. Um, I think that Frank's point is right. Uh, we really do need to do a better job of inter-rater reliability. And the good news about Rho is that it actually makes it easier to code your data because it tells you when you can stop. Um, and it turns out that's very powerful for all the reasons that inferential statistics are powerful. Um, it also makes it possible to do things like uh, increase the number of, of positive examples that you code and still have valid have a, a valid generalization. Um, and that speeds up the, the process as well. So that's built into ENCODER. And again, there's papers coming out about that as well. Um, and I guess the final point I would make is um, it's, it's really important to think take seriously these questions of theoretical saturation. And if there's one big take-home message from quantitative ethnography, it's that we shouldn't be throwing data at the wall. Um, we should be thinking carefully about how statistics can support grounded claims. This is especially true in the learning sciences, but I think it's true in general. Um, we should be thinking about how statistics can support grounded claims rather than just finding patterns in data, because we have so much data. It's easy to find patterns, but those patterns may or may not mean anything. They may or may not actually be important. They may or may not rec uh, represent things that are meaningful to the participants in the discourse, or even that have big effect sizes or that are, uh, matter that much because of the uh, scale of data. Um, so I think those are sort of the big take-home messages that I see um, in this work to the field at large. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, we are uh, happy to, to uh, help people uh, grapple with some of those questions in their own data over time. Okay, thanks again, David and team. Thanks everyone for participating. I think this, is, um, this was a great webinar. And I hope that this will also be heavily used uh, as a kind of recording that will be available uh, on the website later on. So thanks, everyone, and bye-bye.